Tragedy, an event and loss of overwhelming sadness that none of us are safe from, even those ordained by God. Throughout the centuries of monarchic rule and empires, royal families across the world have been struck by tragedy. So many of these tragic outcomes have been the result of devious plots for succession and securing bloodlines, be it a wedding laced in lies, the loss of Margaret of Spain, the non-reign of Louis XVII, or the abducted princes in the tower. Welcome to History on Fleek. Today we look at the five worst royal tragedies in history. While he was undoubtedly one of the most groundbreaking monarchs to ever rule, Louis XIV had a long-running problem throughout his reign and life, his health. Despite having his courtiers and people on hand to serve and protect the monarch, Louis XIV spent the majority of his life in various degrees of physical pain. His ailments were numerous and recurring. On the milder end of suffering, the king would deal with headaches, fainting spells, and gout. Unfortunately for Louis XIV, that was just the beginning. Louis the Great was his much-promoted image of a powerful and sprightly king. Behind closed doors, he lived with ongoing conditions like diabetes, rheumatism, and the painful bone-swelling condition, periostitis. Come 20 years into his reign in 1668, Louis XIV was suffering from obesity and had received middle-period dentistry for an abscess in his mouth. The result was brutal teeth pulling, a hole in his gum, and breath to raise the dead. When the Sun King had the misfortune to develop a painful anal cyst and could no longer ride a horse, he was also subjected to middle-period surgical efforts. The no-doubt agonizing procedure was carried out by France's most skilled physician, but the king took two whole months to recover. As Louis XIV aged and his health deteriorated, he was subject to further medieval medical treatment. Consistent and frequent enemas and bleedings were the primary regular treatments of the king. Both these antiquated methods of healthcare have come to be seen as likely exhausting and exasperating the king's medical fatigue. Louis XIV would die in August 1715 from gangrene. His usual procedures of bleeding and enemas did nothing to stop the pain in his leg. Four days after the gangrene had traveled all the way to his thigh, the king was dead. Though his own medical health cannot be discounted, could this great historical monarch have been granted a better life and health at a time of better medical care? You decide. History can be cruel to anybody, and it turns out that being born into royal lineage doesn't necessarily spare a person. Born in 1785, Louis XVII was born the son of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, and therefore a rightful claimant to the throne. Unfortunately for Louis XVII, he was brought into life during the most tumultuous time in the entire history of France. It really doesn't help having a lineage to the throne when your country bursts into anti-monarchy revolution four years after you're born. In October of 1789, the royal family of France was driven out of Versailles by a mob and forced to live under armed guard in Tuileries Palace in Paris. Following failed attempts at escape as the French Revolution took hold, the royal family was soon placed under arrest at the Square du Temple. In January of 1793, just weeks before Louis XVII's eighth birthday, his father was executed, and the French Revolution was well and truly underway. Though many battles and waves would make up the entirety of the revolution, in eyes of France's remaining royalists, Louis XVII was the rightful heir to the throne. The problem? Um, by the time the very young man came to his claim, France was, well, a republic. Tragically, amid this political revolution, the young Louis Charles remained imprisoned and under guardship by the Committee of Public Safety. Stories of the child-to-be king being subjected to manipulation and even abuse at such a young age are rife, yet not verified. The picture painted leaves much to be desired, a relative innocent being used as a pawn in political maneuvering. Separated from his family and shuffled between guardians just four years into his imprisonment at the age of 10, Louis XVII died. The autopsy revealed scars all over the boy's body and a myobacterial infection that had been there for some time. Louis XVII never got a chance to rule France, but quite tragically, with only 10 years to his name, he never got a chance at life either.
One of the greatest priorities of any monarchy is succession and marriage and securing their bloodlines. That is when everything goes to plan. George IV was King of the United Kingdom and Ireland and the King of Hanover from 1820 to 1830. His reign was a tale of two kings. Some knew George IV as the first gentleman of England, a man of charm and wit, living a life of extravagance in the Regency era. Yet many publicly regarded the king as a wastrel, living a life of excess with poor relationships with his closest throughout his life. Routinely dismissed as a glutton and lazy, it was written the king would always choose a girl in a bottle to politic and a sermon. In what will be no plot twist to this life, George IV decided to marry when his debts were piling up and he would receive no financial support till he was wedded. His family chose his cousin, Caroline of Brunswick, as the bride-to-be. And, well, it was all downhill from there. George arrived at the marriage with more baggage than an international airport, and Caroline was hardly his choice of suitor. George IV was not taken with his cousin. He saw her as frankly unattractive and was convinced she was not a virgin when they wed. The fact that George was not apparently passed him by. Furthermore, the fact that he was already secretly wed to Maria Fitzherbert was not vital information in his eyes either. The wedding ceremony in 1795 was a spectacle of bad omens. George was reportedly heavily inebriated for the wedding and, according to his bride, spent the best part of his bridal night horizontal and blotto. Despite being disastrously unsuited to each other, the couple did manage to sire a child, Princess Charlotte, born in 1796. However, the two would live entirely separate lives afterward, with George forever followed by accusations of philandering. Some poetic justice was served, however, when it came time for George's coronation. Caroline was adored by the public as the wronged wife, and his attempts to divorce her were declined. Caroline would become queen consort despite being barred from his coronation in July 1821. Sadly, Caroline would die just three weeks later, lionized by the English public, but wronged in life. Immortalized in the classic Spanish artworks of Diego Velázquez, Margaret Teresa of Spain was a monarch fated for tragedy. The daughter of King Philip IV of Spain, who referred to his daughter as his joy in private letters, was afforded the finest education and privileges of the Madrid court. Yet family lineage is a funky business. Margaret did have a younger brother, but due to consanguinity, what you or I would know as inbreeding, was riddled with health problems. Following the death of their father, the hand of King Philip IV of Spain's daughter became valuable political capital. At the age of 16, Margaret was announced to be married to Leopold I, Holy Roman Emperor, in a ceremony for the ages in Vienna, where an open-air theater and a grand opera were staged, the couple was wed in 1666. The ceremony had left the Infanta, as Margaret was affectionately known as Holy Empress, German Queen, Archduchess of Austria, and Queen of Bohemia and Hungary. Not bad for wedding gifts, huh? Remarkably, despite this political marriage of monarchies, both Leopold I and Margaret Theresa shared a marriage of respect and affection. An age difference and less than beautiful appearance did not derail a couple who would give each other pet names, Gretel and Uncle. The fate of this young Holy Roman Empress would turn with the duties of royal lineage. During her six years of marriage, she conceived six times. While this would produce Leopold I and Margaret's four children and heirs, it would take a massive toll and the beloved Margaret's health. She would also miscarry twice during this time, and four months into her seventh pregnancy at just 21 years old, Margaret would die in March of 1673. Buried in Vienna in the imperial crypt, her passing would only inspire further succession disputes and soon the War of the Spanish Succession. Perhaps the most notorious royal tragedies of the Middle Ages belong to the tale of the princes in the tower. A story of succession claim gone macabre, England in the late 1400s faced political chicanery for successors to the throne. Monarch for two separate reigns and a seminal figure in the War of the Roses, King Edward IV was overcome with illness in 1483 and shocked the realm with his death just weeks later. Edward had two sons, Richard of Shrewsbury, Duke of York, age nine years old, and Edward V, just 12. 
Unfortunately for these rightful heirs to their father's throne, they had a regent in the form of their uncle. The man in question happened to be Richard of Gloucester, or as you likely know him, Richard III. Upon King Edward IV's death, Richard of Gloucester decided both boys should be placed in the Tower of London. Yeah, Richard III, no grief counselor at the best of times. A political stalwart, Richard was able to convince the powers that be that the lodging in the tower was to prepare the young Edward V for his coming coronation. Though conveniently enough for Richard, during their time in the tower, both boys were discovered to be illegitimate. You'll never guess who was then next in line for the throne. Drum roll, please. Richard of Gloucester. Chillingly, nobody ever saw the two princes again. Rumors abound that Richard III had them killed to bring himself the crown, but that was never verified. Other rumors declared that the princess had managed to escape and were subsequently assassinated. It would be 200 years before the truth would come to light. In the late 1600s, a box under a staircase was found by workmen at the Tower of London. Inside the wooden box were discovered two small human skeletons. Though never proven, these remains are believed to be of the two princes in the tower. In defense of these princes, they did have Richard III for an uncle. This is History on Fleek, and we'll see you next time.